can you name the team that's changed its logo more than any other in the NFL? How about the only team that has never altered theirs, not even once? Do you know which logo has been in use the longest? It's time to find out the story behind every team's trademark. It's NFL Explained, evolution of every team's logo. Remember the first time you ever saw an NFL team when you were a kid? For many of us, the very first thing that caught our attention, those helmets and those logos on the side. Symbols we as fans don in every form and fashion we can think of. I like this kind of party. I like this kind of party, baby. There is something about them, that iconic boisterous blue star, the silver and black eye-patched raider. They're more than just a way to tell the difference between combatants. Those logos tell a story, like when you see that oval-shaped white G over that deep green. It captures history. Packers trying for the go-ahead score. Takes the snap. He's got the quarterback. He's in the touchdown. The Packers are out in front. The designs of most NFL team trademarks have changed quite a bit over the decades. Not only are you going to see the transformation each team's logo has undergone, save a few minor cosmetic changes here and there, but we'll also go back and see all the modern helmets each team has adorned. When the Packers first strapped on headgear, their famous G was not on it, but that original G was so eye-catching they had several schools ask them if it was okay to copy it. They approved its use for schools like Grambling State and Georgia, but they're pretty guarded with it. When the Packers joined the league in 1921, they were using this logo. That's right, before corporations were slapping their names on stadiums, they were doing it to team logos. They were sponsored by the Acme Meatpacking Company, the only pro football team that ever had a sponsorship on their jersey. That uniform-looking patch logo representing the packing company sponsor didn't even make it through that year. The sponsor was dropped. Pretty funny now. It's pretty embarrassing back then. Packers didn't bother with another emblem until the late 1930s. They wanted something that would reflect the city's name. Green Bay Packers football team is the Green Bay community. And the color of the team's often used uniforms, which were blue. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah, the Green Bay Packers were known as the Blues by many of their fans in the early days. Curly Lambeau, the team's original founder and coach, went to Notre Dame. So they came up with this, the letters G and B in blue. It's one of the most obscure logos in league history. You'll be hard pressed to find it on a ticket or a program from that era. But Vince Lombardi was seen wearing it on his hats and jackets decades later. Curly Lambeau would leave the team in 1949 and that opened the door for change. 1950, that's when the team shifted to a green and yellow colored insignia. Packers spelled out in hunter green in front of an orange football. The Hunter Green was supposed to emphasize new head coach Greg Renzani's boisterous statement when he took the job. We are the Green Bay Packers. The sun peeks through the cloudy skies. The town of Green Bay becomes the sports capital of the world. Renzani was only green, though, through the 1953 season, and with a new coach came a new emblem, a yellow football player wearing the number 41. The story behind the number 41, it was worn by both Arnie Herbert and Clark Hinkle, both Packers Hall of Famers. Apparently, Green Bay gave their head coaches a lot of pull when it came to logos, because when Vince Lombardi shows up in 1959, he had it altered to a player giving the Heisman pose over the top of the state and the football. Up to that point, they were playing with a predominantly plain yellow helmet striped down the middle. Finally, in 1961, Lombardi asked his equipment manager to come up with a new design. What the hell's going on out here? For the love of peace. Something that could be put on their headgear. The assistant passed the buck to his assistant, who was an art student. He, in turn, came up with the now famous football-shaped English G. Lots of fans don't realize the shape had a purpose. I think that logo, that elongated G, it is simple, it is distinctive, and it doesn't look like anything else. It's named Ice Capades. They slapped it onto both sides of their helmets, making 1961 the first year the Packers would walk onto the field with one of the most revered uniforms in all of sports. To me, it's a royal uniform. 
the G is the only logo that has ever appeared on their helmets. All right, okay then, we're good. We're good. We're good. That G has only undergone one facelift since then. 1980, they added a yellow outline to it. Green Bay has played some games in throwback uniforms. In the 90s, there was their plain yellow look. Then later, they wore those brown helmets. Aaron Rodgers and the Packers in these throwback unis from 1929. As easily recognizable as that G is, it still pales in comparison to the league's most famous logo, the blue star of the Dallas Cowboys. The original design, as simple as it gets, a plain blue Lone Star for the Lone Star State, of course. And it was on their helmets right out of the gate when they joined the league in 1960. Eddie LeBaron uncorks the Cowboys' money play. Frank Clark gathers in the long rollout pass, outruns the Pittsburgh defense on a 75-yard touchdown, the first Dallas touchdown in official league play. Not that stars are hard to draw, but the credit for the Cowboys star goes to the team's equipment manager at the time, Jack Eskridge, who also updated the star in 1964. And for this, this, he deserves a hearty tip of the cap. Yes! Nice job! The touches he added, helping make it one of the most recognizable symbols in all of sports, not just the NFL. If you'd asked me would a logo of a star work, I, I might be a bit skeptical, but it is iconic. It defines the Dallas Cowboys. The outline, though, necessitated a change in their helmet color. 1964, the year Dallas's iconic look really took shape. I have to say that that look has stood the test of time. That really evokes who the Cowboys are. The Cowboys have not altered their famous star since, making it the oldest primary logo in use. As to why the star is blue, it was meant to represent peace and serenity. A little strange since it was designed for a football team. Dallas did get in on the throwback look as well. In the mid-2000s, they broke out white helmets with the old simple blue star. Bang, bang, touchdown, Julius Jones. Dallas falls well below the average when it comes to altering its visual brand. The average team has made about five to six changes over the years. Get out of here. Are you serious? Teams like the Patriots, for example. T-E-A-M as in team. used their first logo on their helmets when they made their AFL debut in 1960. It's the kickoff. September 9, 1960 sees the first game on the new professional football league at Boston University Field. A Massachusetts railway worker came up with the blue tri-corner hat design. It's the least recognizable look for New England because it only lasted one year. It was very hard for people to make out what it was. It was this sort of amorphous lump. Throughout the 1960 season, a Boston Globe cartoonist was drawing a character named Pat Patriot. Team owner Billy Sullivan liked the Minutemen imagery, and thus Pat getting ready to snap the ball became the official logo in 1961. And I can remember as a young boy just smiling when I saw the Patriots snapping the football. That just looked like just this wonderful image. Pat Patriot, the one and only for sure lineman logo in the NFL. But the best Patriots logo story is about the one that got booed off stage. Let's make sure we got it right. Patriots wanted to start 1980 with a new look. So they put this logo up on the big board at halftime of a 1979 home game. Most people have never seen it because it barely saw the light of day. You got to concentrate on what the hell you're doing, all right? It would play a role in the future, though. The designers of Flying Elvis, the team's current logo, said they used that failed logo as inspiration. Flying Elvis, as it's affectionately known today, made his debut in 1993. It was complete makeover, extreme home makeover in New England. To many fans' delight, Pat, though, has reappeared a number of times when the team breaks out its throwbacks. It's there. The ball is down. The kick is up. And it is good. Still waiting for them to play a game in the tri-cornered hat, though. The guy who came up with the logo that got booed off stage, Stevens Wright. And he may not have struck gold in New England, but he did in Buffalo. That sweet red stripe logo was his. The Bills' early logos were some of the busiest you'll ever see, so no way they were going to go onto a helmet. 
And yeah, the team with those silver helmets you're looking at, it's the Bills. In their first year, they actually adopted the blue and silver of the Detroit Lions. But that went away uh, very quickly, and they wanted to create their own image. 1962 was the year the simple red bison showed up for the first time on their helmets, though it wouldn't be adopted as the team's official logo until 1970. Okay, let's see what we're made of. Ah! Back to that Stevens Wright guy now. He's the one who came up with the Red Streak logo. The story behind what inspired that red stripe is up for debate, too. It hit their helmets in 1974. His daughter says it all had to do with giving the emblem a sense of power and direction. <laughs> But Wright's son says it was an ode to running backs, specifically to O.J. Simpson's 2,000-yard season. Either way, the logo stuck, though the color around it on the helmets changed. 1984, they introduced red helmets. Why? Buffalo's division opponents at the time, Patriots, Dolphins, Colts, all wore white helmets. The wide receivers coaches wanted the Bills quarterback to be able to pick them out, and the red helmet was a factor. In 1994, they utilized those red helmets in paying tribute to their original bison as part of the NFL's 75th anniversary season. Looks and is set. He is hit from behind by guess who? Bruce Smith. And in 2005, same concept, but with white helmets. Hey, Big Bang, I've been waiting on you for this hip wow. I've been waiting on you for it. Hot, hot, hot. The Steelers started off as the Pittsburgh Pirates. Their first logo, the city's coat of arms. Very unique, never been done in the NFL before or since. That was followed by their first actual football insignia. World War II forced them to merge with the Cardinals and Eagles for a season, so they adapted accordingly. Once they were back on their own, they went back to the football-shaped logo until 1962. That's when Steely McBee made his debut. This is the only logo you'll ever see featuring a punter. Punters are people too. Punters are people too. Punters are people too. Yes, punters are people too. The Steely McBeam moniker, though, came after the fact. Pittsburgh introduced a mascot in 2007. A fan submitted the name, and because of the obvious similarities, the old logo often gets referred today as the Steely McBeam logo. But the same year he first appeared, the Steelers put a logo on their helmets for the first time. It wasn't Steely. If you haven't heard the story, owner Art Rooney makes the move to definitively tie his team to Pittsburgh's steel roots, so they get permission to use the steel mark as their logo. It all ties the city, the community, and the team together. Art Rooney, who founded the team, he was incorporating the city into his franchise from the very beginning. They weren't sure if they would like it, though, so they put it on one side to test it out. They wore both black and yellow helmets in 1962. They finished 9-5, and five, their best season in franchise history. Being a little bit superstitious, as, as most people in, in the sports world are, they decided, you know what, let's just keep the logo on the one side of the helmet. And the Steelers lead for the first time 7-3. to three. When they first used the steel mark, the logo just read steel. They had to petition to change it to Steelers. They retired Steely as the team's logo after the 1968 season, and the current look took over for good. Pittsburgh's going to the Super Bowl! Bring the feeling. It has six colors to it, most of any current logo. Those diamonds? They're actually called hypocloids. What each stands for depends on who you listen to. They're iron, fire, and water, the components used to make steel. It conveys the image of Pittsburgh as a steel town. The black and the gold says this is a team that does not suffer fools gladly, that is serious about its work. Smash my football, baby! 2007, they did bring back the yellow helmet for throwback purposes. Staying in Pennsylvania, the Eagles have a long logo history, being they've been around since the early 30s as well. Their original logo and their team name inspired by the National Recovery Act emblem. 
they take the symbol of the National Recovery Act, the Eagle, the symbol that's saying that there's hope and that we're going to fight through this, we're going to win. The Eagle was blue, so was Philadelphia's. When they played as the Steagles, merging with Pittsburgh for a season due to World War II player shortages, they introduced a new logo, one of the best the league has ever seen, a sleek black eagle with a helmet in its talons. When the merger was over, the logo was simply colored green. A new flying eagle was designed for the 1948 season. It lasted two decades before it was updated. The more robotic looking bird only lasted three years, and then they simply used their helmet as their logo. They first put the wing on their helmets in 1954. Philly's head coach at the time, Jim Tremble, made it happen. He said they played a game against the Rams and thought their horns were cool. It's a gone goose to Tommy McDonald for 33 yards and the touchdown. Philadelphia's headgear has featured a wing on it ever since. In 1969, they added a white helmet to the mix. Those wings were a little shorter and colored green. As for the current logo and why it's, quote, backwards, most Philly loyalists know the story. The feathers on the eagle form the letter E. They don't really care what anybody thinks that Philadelphians, they march to their own drummer. Fly, eagles, fly, on the road to victory. Now, let's talk about the NFL's King Kong logo. The New York Giants are one of the oldest teams in the league, but for the first 20 years of its existence, they didn't have an official emblem. They didn't come up with one until 1945. That's when the giant quarterback was created. His connection to King Kong, the Hollywood star Gorilla's movie poster is believed to have provided inspiration for the original design. I'd hate that to fight that son of a gun. None of those images made their helmets, of course. The first time they wore anything on their headgear was 1961. The giant QB was retired and the lowercase NY was born. The New York Giants looked like a totally different football team. Marie Barkley Steinmuller, by the way, the artist for both, making her the only known female to design an NFL logo. Open two left, 48 G-O on two, hey. hit. That NY was altered once for the 1975 season. And that simple, elegant, lowercase NY on the helmet was replaced with this very 70s capital NY that also looked like something that you would have seen in the World Football League. Welcome to when the G-Men moved into the Meadowlands in New Jersey, they figured a change was necessary, being they weren't in New York anymore. Yeah, you mind. You mind, baby. Welcome to Giant Stadium. The escalator immediately in front of you will take you to the upper level. That's what drove them to switch to Giants, spelled out. Um, I gotta do that in this. However, in the year 2000, they switched back, which was a little controversial. How can your logo and name for that matter represent New York if you're playing in New Jersey? Wellington Mara, the team's owner, said the NY logo was one of the greatest in all of football, arguing it was an injustice not to use it. It was essentially a throwback uniform done right. Plus, he said the team represents the region, not just a given city. It is caught by Tyree. Oh my God. Their roommates, the New York Jets, agree. When they joined the AFL in 1960, they weren't the Jets, they were the Titans of New York. Their team colors, blue and gold. Al Doro is the quarterback. They didn't add anything to their helmets initially, they were just plain blue. By 1963, they had a new owner, they changed their name to the Jets, and rolled with some of the coolest helmets the league has ever seen. It's one of the few cartoon-style logos to ever make it on the players' helmets. Unfortunately, it only lasted a year. Some people don't like it. 
and then it was onto the logo that has been the foundation for their look ever since. Initially, it was predominantly white and placed on white helmets. And the Jets make their debut in Shea Stadium, a 30-6 triumph over the Denver Broncos. Those were hard to see, so the logo was colored green. From 1978 to 1997, the Jets logo no longer featured the football outline. 1978, the first season the Jets would wear green helmets, too. We got the redesign of the modern Concord Jets that looked very modern at the time. We went through that about 15 years, and then it was time to go back to the classic Jets. The old logo look was restored in 1998 by head coach Bill Parcells, of all people, who was looking to create a new identity for the team. You want to go to the Arena League? Play over there. Hey, hey, hey. They tweaked it again in 2019. Their helmet's look has undergone more changes than their actual logo. Since 1990, their headgear has had all sorts of different styles. Everyone knows the Brown story. They're the only team without a traditional logo on their helmets. The plain orange helmet is their logo. There he goes! Touchdown! No logo. Couldn't be bothered. Again, it, it goes back to the no-nonsense attitude of Paul Brown. But it wasn't always that way. That's where Brownie the Elf comes in, and he comes in with a rich backstory. was the team's first official logo. Arthur McBride was the team's owner when they formed in the late 1940s. One account says he chose Brownie from a list of fan submissions. Like an elf, this weird little brownie with a little pointed cap and, and a really fierce scowl on its face. Others say it was because McBride's son went to Notre Dame and therefore it's an homage to their leprechaun. Either way, the fan base dug him. The team even went as far as to hire a guy who served as a sort of real life brownie. He roamed their sidelines in their early days. Brownie didn't make it onto a helmet, but he was close. He had one of his assistant coaches who was trying out different styles of the brownie on the side of the helmet. It never got past the design phase. Then Art Modell buys the team in 1961. He did not like Brownie telling a reporter, my first official act as owner of the Browns will be to get rid of that little elf. Though he didn't call him an elf. I have to do what I have to do. Took him a few seasons to exile Brownie. 1970, that's when they tabbed the orange helmet as their team logo. Brownie never made it onto any helmets, but Cleveland did toy with putting something on their protective headgear. Not a widely known story, but in 1965, these CB helmets were worn in a preseason game. Players did not seem to like that logo. Even during the game, you saw some of the players ripping that logo off the side of their helmet. If you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. Cleveland has rolled with the plain look ever since, though they've modernized the helmet logo over the years. It helps define the city and define the people. They know what they're all about. They don't need a lot of flash and blitz. You know, they are a working man's team. Only thing to ever appear on their helmets in real games, numbers. They were on the 1960 helmets, and then again most recently on their 2021 helmets, that season marking the Browns' 75th in existence. They got him again, Miles Garrett, four and a half sacks! This many? <laughs> Denver's logo has undergone a full transformation since joining the AFL in 1960. Started out with a cartoonish style that was common in the 50s and 60s, initially the Broncos wore brown helmets with numbers on them. But give them props because they did eventually use their cartoon Bronco on their helmets. 1962, this is one of the most epic helmets in AFL-NFL history. The fans respond, listen to this crowd. Their first update came in 1968 when they moved to the D with the Bronco in the middle of it. If he takes off, then you go to the tight end. He'll be wide open. Probably going in because the flow's going out. A guy named Edwin Taylor sent the team his design, got a letter back saying, thanks, we're gonna use it. I love 
love you. What did he get for it? That letter of thanks, a shirt, a hat, and two tickets to a game against the Chiefs, which he didn't go to. Dolphin, ready, hey. Denver updated to their current mark, sometimes referred to as the Cyber Horse for the 1997 season. Say what you want about it, they won back-to-back -back Super Bowls after the change. John Elway on target to be the game's most valuable player. Yeah! Ever notice the shape of the nostril on the horse? If you haven't, you should just do it. When they came up with the design, they had a partnership with a certain sports apparel company. Denver has worn all of their old helmets since. The bucking cartoon Bronco showed up in 1994. The brown numbered ones came back for a couple games in 2009. The classic D returned in 2016 with a darker blue helmet. Be the best, man! Come on, man. Come on, man. Best in the league. Come on, man. Best in the league. The Chiefs were in Dallas before moving to Kansas City, their first logo featuring a cowboy over the state of Texas. The cowboy didn't make it onto the field or their unis, their original helmets simply featuring the state of Texas on them. They wore that logo in 1994 for throwback purposes too. Damn the thing to dominate, man. Dominate on three. One, two, three. Dominate. They moved to Kansas City in 1963, <laughs> renamed themselves the Chiefs, swapped Texas for a more regional look, and made the Cowboy a Native American. Go Chief, go! Go Chief, go! That was also the year they introduced their famous Arrowhead. They can sort of thank the 49ers for the KC look inside of it. Owner Lamar Hunt liked the look of San Francisco's interlocking S and F. That's where the Chiefs' interlocking K and C derived its inspiration. Lamar Hunt sat in his kitchen and sketched out the arrowhead with the interlocking KC, which would become one of the enduring emblems of American sports, and he just did it on his own. That's good. You marked it good. You marked it good. You did a hell of a job. Nice score. Great job. You marked it good. The fun fact about their logo, those interlocking letters face the correct way on both sides of the helmet making them one of two teams, the Ravens are the other, who have two different logos on their helmets, technically speaking. Niners might have the best inspiration-related story of any team. This is their first team logo. Alan Sorrell was one of the team's original owners. As the story goes, he saw a drunken gold digger standing near a freight train holding a pistol in each hand and thought, perfect. That makes this the only logo featuring someone inebriated. I like my boys happy. I like my boys happy. The drunk miner never made it onto any headgear, of course. They actually used three different colored helmets early on, red, white, and silver. This has got to be the alley-oop. There is no time for anything else. Tittle throws. Owens is double teamed. He's going downfield. He has a goal run. He goes up. He's got it. A right the 49ers interlocking S and F logo first appeared on their helmets in 1962. It's the only logo to ever appear on their helmets though not a lot of people realize how close they came to ditching their classic oval in favor of this. What was that one? That one came out of the left field. Back to that Stevens Wright guy again, designer of the previously mentioned Bill's Red Streak emblem and the failed Pats logo. Yeah, this was his too. 49ers fans' reactions to it kept it from ever being worn by any of their players. Ouch. Orleans, they've had the same basic logo since they joined the league in 1967. It's been updated over the years, and it's been on their helmets from the start. Go ahead, if you're from New Orleans or have visited there, you likely know that symbol as the fleur de lis. It's a French word that means lily flower. Do you love it? And while that doesn't sound very football tough, it's the Louisiana state symbol. That little flower is intertwined with the city and its history. The sense that there was some French component, something in the background of New Orleans, came from the Fleur de Lis. And you would be hard pressed to come up with any other symbol that could as convincingly evoke New Orleans as that symbol.
Great tempo and rhythm here. Saints have always laid that symbol across gold, but they experimented with a different helmet color once. 1969 preseason, they almost switched to a black helmet. Fans didn't like it, and the team didn't notify the NFL about the possible change, so the concept was scrubbed. Let's have fun. Let's play loose. Do your job. Play for the man next year and believe. Now to the Bears and their crooked C explanation forthcoming. I want it done right. Chicago started out as the Decatur Staley's. The A&E Staley Starch Company owned them when they started in 1920. So like the Packers, they simply utilized the company's trademark as their initial logo. George Hallis bought the team, didn't bother with an emblem until 1940. They tried a couple different looks using a bear, and then finally came the Wishbone Sea in 1962. It was white. They added it to their helmets that same year. Gail Sayers, the superstar. He cuts, weaves, stops, and goes. He runs with power and precision. Chicago updated the color in 1973, changing it to orange with a white and blue outline. I can remember in the early 70s, the Bears added that orange to their helmet, and that looked just exotic. What were the, oh, the bears are, they're crazy. Butkus was a crafty signal caller who utilized methods both extreme and unusual in pursuit of success. But they did not update the shape of the actual C, which is not symmetrical. It's an optical design. In layman's terms, if you look real close, the wishbone portion of the C isn't exactly centered. And the mouth of the letter has what amounts to an underbite. When applied to a rounded helmet, though, it all works itself out. Throws up the middle of the field. Oh, it's picked up by Brian Over the years, the Bears' throwback looks have ranged from plain dark blue to the white C and the three orange stripes. The Bears will don the 1936 Chicago Bears uniforms for the first time, well, since over three quarters of a century ago. Colts started out in Baltimore in 1953, so they were in the middle of the cartoon wave, so to speak, and that helped produce their bucking horse logo, another classic. It was updated, but that Colt represented the team until 1979, which was the year they officially went with their simpler horseshoe. It was obvious thought of a horse and a Colt, but it's more than that. It's luck and success. It has seven white grommets on it. Seems purposeful to the game of football, right? No matter what their official logo has been, the only thing that's ever been placed on their helmets is the horseshoe. Though to start, they played in blank white helmets. They were the second team in the NFL behind the Rams to add a logo to their headgear, but it was far from a traditional placement. They had that horseshoe logo on the backside of the helmet. The horseshoes originally placed on the lower backside of blue helmets, making them the only team to ever put their logo in that position. 1956, back to white helmets, the horseshoes on the back now blue. Then in 1957, they moved them to the sides, perfect timing since they would play in the title game in front of a national audience in 1958. It's third and one yard to go for the championship. United gives Gronichi the top for the world champion. They have since played some games in throwback helmets, honoring the original back of the helmet logo look. The 1955 Colt uniforms. I like the helmets. The Houston Texans joined the league in 2002. They came up with this red, white, and blue colored bullhead and have never touched it since. The expansion franchise had come up with its team colors ahead of time. Their logo using the flag, but also building in the horns, because cattle are so vital to the history of Texas. To me, it was just a brilliant logo. The bull's head, by the way, isn't just any bull. It's a Spanish fighting bull. Are you kidding me? I'm beating these guys like a drum out here. And the overall shape, it's a knight's shield. Have to look kind of hard, but kind of cool when you realize it. The curve in the skull also creates the shape of the Gulf Coast of Texas. Let's go!
Minnesota is one of those teams whose official logo and helmet logo have always differed. They've altered the Norseman logo two times, but the horn on their helmets, the same today as it was when they debuted in 1961. Hi, this is a Minnesota Viking football helmet. It was in the middle of a lot of hard-nosed football last year. It took a lot of punishment and it's handed out some too. Regulators, mount up, we're coming. <laughs> purple gold color palette, the guy who drew the logo went to the University of Washington. The founder of the team though, Ollie Hosgrud, also went to a high school where the mascot was a Viking and the colors were purple and gold, so take your pick. It wasn't merely that the purple of the Viking's helmet did not match the purple of the jersey, it was that different sections of the jersey did not match. I look cute, boy. I look cute. <laughs> Here's the thing about the famous horn. Historians say actual Vikings back in the day did not wear helmets with horns on them. What the f Are you kidding me? Cincinnati's first logo might be Chester Cheetah's father or grandfather or some crazed cousin of Tony the Tiger, neither of whom are Bengals, though. The cartoonish logo would never make it onto a helmet. They chose to go with one of the most straightforward looks you'll ever see. Bengals spelled out on their helmet, the lettering as simple as it gets. That look would become their official logo starting in 1970. The legendary Paul Brown, their head coach, vice president, and GM at the time, chose the look and ended it too. He said you couldn't read the name from far away. Best part of their logo history? This is Brown in 1968 deciding what their helmets should look like. He was holding the design that would become synonymous with Bengals football. The famous stripes were finally introduced in 1981, the same season the Bengals would make their first Super Bowl. This brash new breed of cat was prepared to defend its lair with a newfound ferocity. <laughs> I tell you the truth, when you wear a helmet like that, it's one of those situations you either got to put up or shut up. You either got to play or they're going to laugh you out of the league. When the Bengals uniform debuted, people looked at it and said, what is it? But the look was so distinctive, it was almost like your stuffy friend went away for a while and, and comes back with a tan and driving a convertible and wearing loud sports clothes. In 1997, they tried out a leaping bangle as well as just a bangle's head. Neither were placed on their helmet. And then eventually, they put the stripes on the letter B. Let's go, baby! That's what I'm talking about! The classic spelled out bangles look did make it back for a game in 1994, still one of my personal favorites. Seattle's streaking Seahawk has seen a couple alterations over the years, but it looks mostly like it did when they debuted in 1976. Seattle would eventually change their helmet color. They called it Seahawk Blue. Literally, the color is called Seahawk Blue because nobody had seen it before. The Seahawk himself hasn't changed much. The inspiration for the hawk? This Native American hand-carved eagle mask. Catch that? It's an eagle. So why wouldn't they use an actual Seahawk, you ask? Well, because they've only ever been spotted hanging out with jackalopes, i.e. there's no such thing as a Seahawk, technically anyway. No disrespect to the Osprey. <laughs> Tell him. It is unbelievable. Can yep. we edit that? Yeah. I don't want nobody to know that. The Ravens have only had two logos in their history. Each has a good story. <laughs> Remember the first one, the flying bee that had that shield in the middle? Let's go, baby, let's go! Well, when the news broke the Browns were relocating to Baltimore, a security guard and amateur artist, without being asked, submitted this design. Yeah, it looks pretty similar, doesn't it? He said they could use it, too. All he wanted back was an autographed helmet in return. Same thing will make you laugh or make you cry. The team said no, 
So we took them to court and won, and that's why the team made the swap to their current logo. The iconic Raven's Head logo was born from a newspaper contest. Fans voted for it, and owner Art Modell added the B for Baltimore. Which is unique because the B faces the correct way on both sides of the helmet. That means technically, they join the Chiefs as the only two teams to use a different logo on each side. We've been here before, man. Y'all know what's up. Buccaneers, only a handful of logo changes in their existence. Their original emblem, one of the most infamous in the league's history. It's the mid 70s, it's big hair, it's loud colors. Bucko Bruce, drawn by a Tampa Tribune cartoonist. Thing was, the artist actually submitted a flag logo to then owner Hugh Culverhouse, but he rejected it and said yes to Bucko. Wake up! You're looking at me like I'm not even talking. You're not hearing me. Bucko was retired after the 1996 season, as was their orange creamsicle motif. In the popular terminology, they needed to rebrand, and they rebranded radically. Raise the battle flag. Pewter power. You're the best uniform the league. The pewter-colored helmet and the skeleton with the crossed swords took over. The new identity was exactly what the franchise needed. This is now our new look. This is the pirate look. This is our mean, nasty look. We are now the team that's going to be intimidating. It works a lot better when you win a Super Bowl after the redesign. Woo! Bucko is an icon, though, and lucky for fans, he's made a few appearances since being put out to pasture. Lamar Sparkman, the man responsible for Bruce, said he wanted him to appear cavalier and not a hairy-legged slob. Mission accomplished, I guess. And the original pirate logo winking at you just was not what you would call manly. The inspiration behind the eye-winking, plume-feathered wearing buccaneer? Yo, yo, yo. Yo, he is a magician. I'm convinced. Actor Errol Flynn, who starred in The Adventures of Robin Hood and Captain Blood. Flynn isn't the only movie star who shows up in an NFL logo. The famed Raiders insignia also owes a nod to the big screen. The Raiders portrait was reportedly inspired by the face of American movie star Randolph Scott. There have been five iterations of their logo. There was an intent to evoke menace, and the team's playing style did exactly that. The first did not include a shield, and it wasn't on their helmets. You feel like you're looking at old footage of the Steelers, but the Raiders started out as a black and gold team. Then, Mr. Just Win Baby showed up in 1963. Just Win Baby! <laughs> The Oakland Raiders was added to their crest along with the iconic shield and for the first time appeared on their helmets. They took that pirate or raider and made him this symbol of intimidation. There was a problem. It didn't really stick out on their headgear. See how helmets impacted logo design? So the next season, they simplified it and colored the shield black. Here's the catch with that shield. Al Davis was with the Chargers prior to joining the Raiders. Their first logo, look at that, included a shield. Oakland's signature inspired by their rival. That makes an easy transition. The Chargers started in Los Angeles, moved to San Diego, then back to LA. Touchdown, Chargers! Which set up the shortest lived logo in league history. That gummit! Charger symbol has always featured a lightning bolt in it, and the bolt has always been on their helmets, the design varying over the years. First season, it was a simple dark bolt on a white helmet. 1961 was the first time they colored the bolt yellow. Now the San Diego Chargers are a reality and will play their games and remodel Balboa Stadium in the fall of 1961. And they always had the players' numbers on there. Until 1974, that's when they decided to make a dark blue helmet with the bull on it, their new logo, which coincided with their new look on the field. The redecorated Chargers sported change from top to bottom. They modernized their helmet logo once before simplifying it to just the bull, which they've tinkered with a few times. They've donned several throwback helmets in recent years, sporting both their old white look. He scores! 
as well as helmets with the blue lightning bolt. But back to their short-lived Dodgers logo. After returning to LA in 2017, they wanted to come up with a new emblem that would help tie themselves to the city. So they came up with this. The response was so negative. Damn it. Son of a out of here. They trashed it. And you're out of here. You're out of here. Literally two days after unveiling it. Call them the kings of the logo change. No team has made more alterations than the LA Rams. they've had so much trouble sticking to one image, they've moved around a lot. They started in Cleveland with a ram's head. The ram's horn, though, is what has endured for the most part. And that ram's horn is historical. It's the first logo to ever appear on an NFL helmet, 1948. Fred Gerke has the idea for ram's horns, and he paints one on one helmet, and the owner pays Gerke a dollar a helmet to paint the whole team. They were a glamour team in pro football when there really weren't a lot of glamour teams and you just had this aura of celebrity. It's the only logo to appear on pre-modern face-masked helmets. In 1949, they wore red helmets with the horn. In 1964, they changed the color of the horns to white. It was a very neat, clean look, but the fans missed their yellow. It wasn't the Rams without the yellow. The team did move away from Ram imagery a couple times in their history, too. The first time it happened, 1984. There was some debate if the team ever really made it their official seal, but the team says this was it for five seasons, probably the most obscure logo, if you will. They were trying to make it clear they were an LA team. So we don't have a sun problem. We're going to left with the football. In 1995, they were in St. Louis, so they created a look that incorporated St. Louis's famed Gateway Arch. Tinkering with the horn color didn't stop either. In 2000, the horn took on a gold hue. It eventually went back to yellow and white. Their newest logo iteration unveiled in 2020. The design utilizes the horn, but the Easter egg is how the nearby Pacific Ocean was included. The horn is drawn in such a way as to emulate a wave that's about to crash. Once again, changes were made to how it appeared on their helmets, but hey, they won the Super Bowl in the second year they used it. The greatest of all time on defense does it in the biggest moment of Super Bowl 56. Detroit, another old-timer having been around since 1930. Started as the Portsmouth Spartans, but they moved shortly thereafter. The first Lions logo didn't come along until the 1950s, though, a cartoon football character with a lion below him. Like most teams, their helmets didn't have anything on them until the 60s. It was certainly a simple and a bold design. The silver helmet looked different than what a lot of other teams were sporting. They changed logos in 1961. Any car aficionado can tell you what influenced it. But the logo they placed on their helmets that year was different and would eventually take over as the team's primary insignia. Meet Bubbles. The 1970 logo received the nickname from radio host Art Regner III. He said it looked like the lion was batting bubbles, that he wasn't very fierce. I don't know why they got me mic'd up today. I'm the quietest guy on the team. By 2009, the team seemed to agree. When they updated the lion, they changed his posture a bit, and most importantly, added teeth. You are playing the game of war. Their throwback helmets, a nice plain silver look. The Dolphins logo has remained pretty much the same since it hit the scene in 1966. All right, all right, Miami. Make me look good. Senior created it, the same guy that designed the University of Miami logo. That boy good. 
That was good. Hopefully, he got paid more for that one than he did the Dolphins. 250 bucks. Hey! Hey, it was the 60s. Oddly, he said he didn't really like the original design. He said he wanted to come up with something similar to the Rams look. Fans have joked the original dolphin in the logo had a helmet on it. Let's hope those helmets had blowholes, right? Um, it's not cool. But the biggest debate surrounding their crest, the orange ring. Is it a ring of fire the dolphin is jumping through or is it supposed to represent the sun? Most go with that explanation. The artist passed away without ever being asked about it, by the way. Regardless, some version of it, the only image that's ever been on their helmets, which have always been white. Atlanta, pretty much the same look they had when they joined the league in 1966. You gotta do everything right today, darling, but you gotta have fun doing it. They've made some tweaks to their logo since then, but it's still a Falcon and the letter F. Hold it up and show it to us, Dion. It was on their helmets from the start, the winged symbol over the years being surrounded by both red and black. Woo! Let's go! Cardinals have shuffled through nine total emblems over the years. They stuck with their original double wishbone until 1934. It's considered the godfather of NFL logos. It's the oldest in the NFL that was designed for the purposes of representing a professional team. The Cards were one of the teams involved in merging with Pittsburgh during World War II. That's where Card Pit comes from. Finally, in 1947, Cardinals still in Chicago, we get our first actual Cardinal in the logo. The next big redesign would happen in 1960. That year would also be the first time the iconic Cardinal head would appear on their helmets. It was an unusual logo for the team to adopt. Just the head of a bird, it wasn't a cartoon. It was kind of a realistic depiction of a, of a Cardinal. The Cardinals have stuck with the bird head on their helmets ever since. The buff bird logo itself would only last two seasons though. They took the field goal posts out in 1962 and had the bird running through the city's famed gateway arch. That look lasted until 1970. That's when they finally just focused on the current look. The cardinal head has been tweaked a few times since, but for all intents and purposes, it's been the same from the get-go. In the 21st century, that look has been altered a little bit. Cardinal is an angrier, more aggressive looking cardinal now, more predator than prey. Tennessee Titans, previously the Houston Oilers, whose initial logos were some of the best. They started off with two different cartoon representations. However, their helmets had the iconic oil derrick on them from the start. That's the technical name for those oil rigs, by the way, oil derricks. They used that derrick in their emblem in 1969 on an old school looking player's head, another classic. They eventually simplified it to the oil rig itself. When Houston first kicked things off, they wore blue helmets. In 1966, they unveiled their silver helmets. 1975, they finally went with their famous white ones. Come on now, we gotta take it down there and score. Let's go. Switch, switch. Many Houstonians believe that oil rig look was kidnapped. Bud Adams owned the Oilers. He wanted a new stadium built in Houston. And when it didn't happen, he took his team and everything associated with it to Tennessee, sort of as a way to stick it to the city. But they had their chances. 
Adams had no intention of just starting a new franchise, he was taking the identity and the logos with him. As of 2021, the Titans, not the Texans, have worn the Euler logo four times. When they aren't wearing the throwback logo, they have their Titans T on. It has three stars in it, which is a nod to the Tennessee state flag. But the formation is different, and that wasn't an oversight. It had to do with a legal issue surrounding state flags. Panthers have only made one alteration to its logo, just a minor cosmetic change. That change did not alter the shape of the Panthers' head, and good thing they didn't because there's more to it than meets the eye. You gotta have a plan, man. Oh, man. You gotta have a plan. You gotta have a plan going to two. Its shape intended to resemble the shape of North Carolina and South Carolina combined. We've got this as a regional team that is there for all of the Carolinas. Pretty basic overall look but a helmet that was meant to be cutting edge, and uh, we'd never seen anything like that before. There we go, there we go, there we go, there we go! Jaguars haven't done too much to their emblem either. They've made two tweaks to their Jaguar head since joining the league. Get ready, baby, there's a new cat in the block! Jacksonville right. Jaguar! They originally intended to feature an entire Jaguar body. This is what their helmets almost look like. Familiar? Surprisingly, the initial concept for their logo on their helmet was very similar to the car Jaguar logo. However, shortly after a cease and desist letter was sent by the Jaguar car company, and they decided to go with a different style logo. <laughs> In 2013, the Jaguars tried something that hadn't been seen since the 30s, a multicolored helmet. Lasted five seasons. I think we ain't done yet. I said, I think we ain't done yet. We finish our team logo journey in Washington, who as of 2022 have the newest logo in the NFL. Today, they're revealing a new name and logo. I have not seen it yet, but let's check it out together. These are the Washington Commanders. The future of Washington football is here. Washington's 2022 rebrand, the 11th time the club has altered its crest, making the latest W lucky number 12 for the club. Let's get it today, man. Let's get it. Start of a new journey. Let's go. Historical context is vital to understanding their changes. We won't go deep into it, that's not the point of this story. But this is what they started out with in 1932 in Boston when they were the Braves. The explanation is simple. They named the team after a Major League Baseball's Boston Braves. That was the baseball team's logo. The following year, the team's owner, George Preston Marshall, changed their name to Redskins. The Native American head would go through several transformations over the years. None of them would appear on their helmets for some time. This is the first design they ever used on their headgear, 1958. They had perhaps the most avant-garde helmet, a maroon helmet with the outline of a feather going up over the back of the helmet. They used their feather helmets until 1965, and then came the first big shift. This would be the first time they would move away from the profile pick as their primary logo, instead adopting a feather-adorned spear, which they also would wear on the field. The spear look lasted until 1970 when Vince Lombardi showed up. Apparently, he was really into logos. He wanted the focus to simply be on the letter R, with a couple feathers added to acknowledge the origin of their name. Lombardi would pass away in 1970, the same year they switched to the R look, so it didn't last long. In 1971, Walter Blackie Wetzel, a well-respected member of the Blackfeet tribe, lobbied to remove the R and replace it with a new updated version of their past logos. Go line, go line, I left tight wing, 70 chip on white, ready? Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. Wetzel said he viewed the helmet design as a way to promote his people and shine a spotlight on their causes. The team agreed, and in 1972, it was placed on their helmets for the first time. 
In 1983, they flipped the head around, let the feathers hang off the logo, and that would be it until 2020 when the decision was made to retire the Native American imagery and the name, though owner Daniel Snyder and many fans were not happy about it. But while the team decided on a new moniker, they simply went by the Washington football team. They took a couple seasons to decide on a new name, polls were conducted, research was done, and Commanders was what they ultimately decided to go with. Washington's throwback looks, they've used plain helmets, the spear returned in 2002, the yellow helmet with the R came back in 2007. In 2012, they played a game in these leather-looking helmets meant to replicate their look from the 30s. Washington wearing throwback uniforms and helmets today, honoring the 1937 NFL champion Redskins. And that's a heck of a job making that helmet look like it's from 1937. Yeah, it looks like leather, man. Before we get out of here, let's talk about the NFL logo itself. We'll find out who loves football. You may run into a version online of the shield purporting to be the league's first back in 1920. The NFL name, though, didn't come along until 1922. It was the APFA for three seasons. The first official NFL shield was introduced in 1940, had pinstripes, 25 stars. Why 25? The most commonly held theory is because the league was split into 25 states at the time. The current logo only has eight, which represents the number of divisions. We have that heightened sense of awareness right now. But the very best story surrounding what is now one of the most famous sports logos on the planet, no one has any idea who created it. Excuse me. Are you serious? Don't share either. Don't share. Are you serious? We gotta be legendary. Are you serious? Um, what just happened? NFL logos and the helmets they are placed on will continue to evolve. In 2022, we saw a host of teams unveil brand new alternative looks to their uniforms, an orange Bears helmet, a white Bengals one, the Texans bull backed by a brilliant red, not to mention all the teams that used black as their latest twist. More changes are sure to come. Forward progress! Forward progress! Well, that's just the, that's the spirit. Will someone come up with a digital logo that changes during the game? A 3D logo, maybe. Tell everyone where you think the evolution takes us next. Rank your favorite logos along with the ones that displeased you. That's what the comments section is there for. Very interesting. Fans, in the end, are the true historians many times and usually help tell the whole story when it's all said and done. Let's go! That's a pretty good way to finish.